Hello, and welcome to today's virtual program hosted by the Healthcare Council of Chicago. My name is Megan Phillip, and I'm the Executive Director of HC3. We are a mission-driven platform proactively seeking uncommon alignment to improve Chicago's healthcare ecosystem. As we continue to navigate ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, HC3 launched the transformation series to address how we can leverage our collective resources to foster solutions and help rebuild our communities. COVID-19 has accelerated the growth of a marketplace for telehealth and other virtual healthcare platforms. One of the priorities of these transformation series events is to consider how we can promote digital transformation so solutions to radically improve the healthcare system's performance and reach. So today's theme centers around solutions and we'll be joined by some experts in the field developing and implementing solutions-based approaches to support clinical trials that are being hosted outside of their usual constructs. Before we dive into today's content, I have a few housekeeping items. This morning's discussion will be recorded and shared on our website, www.hc3.health for later viewing and sharing. As we hear from today's experts, if you have any questions, please use the chat function, which will be seen directly by our moderators and who will do their best to address them during the audience Q&A later in today's program. It is now my pleasure to invite today's moderators and panelists to turn on their cameras and join the webinar. Today's event was produced in collaboration with HC3 member Ziegler. And it is my pleasure to turn things over to Grant Chamberlain, Managing Director of Healthcare Corporate Finance at Ziegler. Thank you, Megan. Um, I'm, I'm Grant Chamberlain, I'm Managing Director here at the Chicago-based healthcare investment bank, Ziegler, a 120-year-old healthcare services and technology-focused investment bank and a member of the Healthcare Council of Chicago. Uh, over the last 15 years, my M&A and capital advisory practice has been focused on two parallel paths, digital health and oncology services and technology. In the last couple of years, the two efforts have finally collided. I published our third edition of our white paper on deconstructing the telehealth industry just prior to the COVID pandemic. And the reason Patrick and I are gathered on this call today is that we foreshadowed in that white paper, one of the hot growth segments in telehealth over the next couple of years was the opportunity for virtual care solutions as to enable tele-oncology and facilitate the growth of decentralized clinical trials. So Patrick, you know, why don't you introduce yourself and then I'm gonna ask John Reitz to define what a decentralized clinical trial is is in an introduction. And then have each of our panelists introduce themselves and the roles that each of you and your organization play in decentralized clinical trials. Thank you, Grant, and hello, everybody. My name is Patrick Walsh. I'm also a managing director. I'm based out of Ziegler's Nashville office, and I focus my efforts on the pharma services landscape, as well as the technologies and services surrounding the laboratory industry. Uh, from my perspective, we've seen a number of businesses springing up that are leveraging new technology capabilities to deliver services that were historically bound to centralized locations. One of the first keys to the success of these businesses and these business models is awareness in the general community. And hopefully today we're doing our part to increase that awareness. Perfect. Well, John, why don't you, if you don't mind, you know, give us an overview of what a decentralized clinical trial is and, and how it fits into this discussion. Sure, Grant. Yeah, and thanks for having having me to, to be a part. I know we've got a lot to discuss here. And, and I'll start out by saying this is the one thing I'm going to define. And all of a sudden, 10 people automatically disagree with me the second I say it. It's a no-win battle to define a decentralized trial this day. Uh, so here's what I'd say is that the there's a regulatory definition for decentralized clinical trials that comes from FDA. There's also a sort of residual definition that we get for EMA, for EMA, EMA um, that covers global entities. And what I would say is, you know, very simply put, we talk about decentralized study. It's just what Patrick set up, right? We're, we're taking research that's always happened centrally in a clinic and we're decentralizing, we're changing where, how, and what gets collected. And what that means, you know, just for practical terms is, is we're using technology to engage participants and raters and clinicians directly. We're utilizing home health and other technology of bringing people into the home. So not being in the clinic, going into the patient's home. Um, but we're also looking at 
additional models uh, to, to capture data remotely and in between visits, right? So new types of data models, new types of data capture. So great, high level, you know, we can all get hung up on what the definitions are, if it includes a telehealth visit or not, and, and we're all probably right and all probably wrong. But that in general, think about moving these data collection tools and having different techniques to move research from where it's primarily been only in the clinic to being done in the clinic and a lot of other locations at the same time. That was perfect. Well, John, I'm going to ask, if you don't mind, introduce yourself, introduce the and sort of your role. And I'm, if, if I could then move on and ask the other, you know, other panelists to introduce themselves as, and, and then we'll, we'll move on to specific questions. Sure, happy to. So uh, John Reitz, I'm co-founder and CEO of a company called Thread. And we can learn more about us at threadresearch.com. Um, my career, I spent all in life sciences uh, since I got out of college and was chief paper pusher for files uh, in studies. Um, and about uh, 12 years ago, I got a chance to be on a remote study. And back then there was no tech for this. There were no protocols for this. So you'd build the tech, you'd write the protocol, you team up with people who are like-minded to say, this sounds weird, let's give this a shot. And we did the first studies with apps and the first studies with wearables and the first studies with telehealth and e-consent right? And really moving this work uh, forward. And after doing that a few times with some large pharma companies and publishing it, you started to get a sense of there's something here, but there's barriers to it because everybody didn't have one of these back then, right? Like we all had the first version of iPhone and Blackberries. And so it wasn't their way, but long and short of it is moving through that train. Um, you know, I, I helped to, to co-found Thread. And for the last five years, we've been focused on helping our customers use technology with supporting services to do decentralized studies. So we've now done hundreds of these. These are all that we do. Our focus is on this. And we're doing everything from hybrid decentralized trials, right, which is combinations of visits, um, to fully decentralized studies where there are actually no visits into a clinic because that particular therapeutic area or protocol doesn't require you to come into an office location. And so if you look at those two models, that's a lot of what we focus on. And a lot of our opinions and insight today are, are from lessons learned, gray hair, battle scars, whatever you want to say that we've kind of got doing this in the last five years. Thank you. Well, Melissa, why don't you go next and just give a give an overview on how, what Firma's role is as is, is part of this. And then we're going to move to Jennifer and sort of think about how it is impacting your provider. Sure. Thanks, Grant. Hi, everyone. My name is Melissa Nezos. I'm Vice President of Clinical Operations at Firma Clinical Research. We're a Chicago-based company, and we are a niche provider in the clinical trial industry. We provide services that manage the data from clinical trial, um, but we also support decentralized trials by bringing the clinical trial to the patient. So simply what that means is we assess what can be done in the home and such as maybe vital signs or blood draws and provide a nurse, for example, um, so a patient can remain in the home and participate in the clinical trial. Um, so that's, uh, I guess, a good overview of, of our impact on decentralized trials. And um, I'll pass it on to Jen so she can uh, talk about uh, her role as well. Perfect. Hi, I'm Jennifer Junis. I am the Senior Vice President for Digital Health for OSF Healthcare. We are a 14 hospital Catholic health system, mostly in downstate Illinois, Upper Peninsula of Michigan and one Metro Chicago location. Uh, I have been in my role um, in digital health for about 18 months now. Uh, our structure around digital health, I come from a hospital operations background. I was a chief nursing officer as well as a hospital president in, within our system. And I have brought the operational component to our digital health structure. And we have um, responsibility under the structure I have from digital experience or so digital front door uh, to our remote patient monitoring, to our telehealth, all the way to our on-demand services. So really following the patient journey from a digital standpoint. I've also been very fortunate to participate on the ATA SIG group on decentralized clinical trials and have learned a lot over the last year responding to COVID-19 within the state of Illinois and our partnership there on what it looks like to really scale telehealth and remote patient monitoring to care for those in their home. So we are building a comprehensive cancer center in Peoria, Illinois, and really looking at how we provide access and um, we um, the remote uh, clinical, decentralized clinical trials are a big part of our, our strategy. 
Perfect. Thank you so much. Well, Patrick, I'm going to hand it to you. You certainly are the domain expert here on this topic at Ziegler. I'm just your arm candy here. So why don't you guide the questions from here forward? Well, uh, thanks, Grant. I, I think the, the expertise will, will be uh, obviously coming from the rest of the panel. But uh, I would like to start by defining, uh, you know, kind of the, the needs and values of the various stakeholders that are involved in uh, clinical trials writ large. And, and to get a sense for how your various organizations fit into the larger story of decentralized clinical trials and why DCTs are compelling to your segment of the market. So, uh, John, I'd like to start with you and curious to get your perspective on what benefits exist for pharma sponsors in the, in the utilization of, of decentralized clinical trials. Yeah, so there's there's a few key ones, and let's start with what's important. Why are we decentralizing trials to begin with? We're decentralizing trials not because we're just trying to throw innovation at clinical trials. We're doing it because the economy we all live in, and not just in the U.S. but globally, has moved to where we're all doing things in what's called omni-channel. Right? We're all going into we're all going into a store. We're buying online. We're getting something remotely. We're capturing data. We're doing a lot of things in our lives omni-channel, and our the industry, the one that we all spend time on, is also having to make that move because consumers and people, us, are demanding it. And so I start with, you know, why are we doing it? We're doing it because clinical trials are really hard to participate in. They're very complex. They take a lot of time. And this becomes a real benefit model when we come in to talk to and offer a trial to participant to say, hey, could you come in and do this structure this way? Or would you like a more of a flexible option, right? Would you like to come in the clinic and have a CU via telehealth and have a home health nurse come out and visit you? You know, that combination of flexible models provides a better, more conducive experience to participants, to people uh, in their lifestyle. And so we start there. But the reality too is, is as we look at... Um, you know, and again, I, you know, Jennifer is the expert here, right? I just meet with sites, we support sites. We look at our jobs, not just to support a participant experience, but to, but to augment sites, right? To provide them with technology and tools that makes it easier for them to do more studies at scale, right? If you look at the business model of clinical trials, uh, sites aren't getting wealthy and rich off of three and a half percent profit margins running clinical trials, right? On the average, right? It's really, it's very hard to do that because, you know, participants and the types of studies are getting more complicated, right, Patrick, that's really what we're seeing. And so, so, you know, the stakeholder starting with the participant moving to the site becomes, you know, really important. And so there are a lot of benefits to really helping sites to, to have tools and technology and frameworks to actually support a decentralized trial. You know, overall, really the promise that DCT has is that, you know, if we can make trials more flexible, if we can make them more conducive to lifestyle, if we can capture all the validated assessments that we need that we would do only in a clinic, we can do them in multiple locations, will make recruitment a better solution and won't be a symptom of a problem. We'll be able to open up geographies like we're doing now. We're able to recruit patients from a 350 mile radius, not an average of a 35 mile radius around city centers, right? We'll be able to be more inclusive with study designs, meaning getting to rural populations, getting to um, people who are just not gonna come into a study but would do something like this. And then the third real promise that DCT has is when you look at modernizing anything, leveraging expertise, data, data capture tools, you have an opportunity to actually save money. And our industry has got to come up with better models to take the, the extra money that's getting spent around source data verification and other things that are really kind of outdated. We need to take those out of the system to put money back into more research, put money back into supporting participants, put money back into budgets for sites. And the way we do that is by, by definition is decentralizing or changing how a study is conducted. That's great. Thank you, John. And I'd love to springboard it, uh, springboard off of that for uh, with a, a few questions to Jennifer. Um, you know, Jennifer, I, I think you obviously heard, uh, you know, you know, maybe part of the, the story that John tells to uh, providers and health systems. I'm curious to get your perspective and your role as a provider, you know, internally, what conversations are you having about the, the benefits that you hope to gain from adding decentralized uh, trial elements to your clinical trials? Uh, you, you might be on mute. I think John really nailed it, honestly. Um, when we think about this, it, it really is thinking about a hub and spoke um, really structure. So 
So centralizing the things that need to be centralizing, centralized, and then decentralizing to really build access and relationships. I think one of the things that we have really learned and we're starting to build into all of our models, um, and this will be another one, uh, the decentralized clinical trials, is to begin to think about how we continue to build the relationship through a digital decentralized way with that clinical um, centralized functionality. So I, I spoke to our organization. Most of our um, hospitals are in rural settings. Uh, we have really struggled with access. And when you think about the way for those community members, when you think about the way decentralized clinical trials are are configured and you think about being able to open that up to populations of patients in rural markets that really have not been able to participate in the past due to some of the social determinants of health that we're learning more and more about, especially in this past year, as we look at transportation um, as a gap um, and certainly looking at ways to continue to meet our patients uh, where they are. Uh, that's really our vision uh, within our digital health structure is to meet our patients where they are, uh, provide them with care wherever they are on their journey um, and wherever they live. Uh, so that's been really important uh, to us. That's great. And just in, in, in the work that you have done in the, you know, with the de decentralized uh, clinical trial tools and offerings, do you feel like your patients are uh, you know, witnessing those benefits, you know, I, I think you, you obviously kind of lay out why, you know, why it would have appeal uh, for folks that might only go through one clinical trial in their life. Do, do they, do they recognize that, you know, it's better now than it used to be? Yeah, I think we've learned a lot over, over the last year um, with the pandemic. When you think about those that really can't um, or shouldn't or don't want to leave, leave their home um, from a safety standpoint. And the experience that we're starting to understand is that they will engage with us in different ways. Um, I think, you know, we have become where we were really traditionally focused and we had some belief biases of the engagement and the experience level of our patients uh, needed to be uh, closer uh, to, to the center and, and being able to decentralize and be able to still engage and uh, connect is really, really important. And what we've seen is just an ability to be able to uh, continue to build uh, upon that. That's great, that's great. Well, uh, now that we've started to establish some of our vocabulary and, and folks might be getting a sense of uh, what, a, what a complicated ecosystem this is. I'd like to shift a little bit of focus to what has helped decentralized clinical trials make the progress that they have made in uh, incorporating themselves into kind of a legacy model. So given the diverse benefits that we've outlined for DCTs, uh, I'd like to get a feel for how the adoption of these solutions in the market today and the changes that the market has seen recently uh, allow these solutions to be practical. So First question to Melissa, um, in what circumstances are decentralized clinical trials being used today and what do you see as some of the best use cases for the future? Uh, and maybe to get a, a little bit more specific, are there particular therapeutic areas or even trial phases that, uh, you know, you know where, where these capabilities resonate particularly or where, where these types of capabilities are needed? Sure, sure. Good questions. Um, well, this is obviously super relevant today with the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, you know, we are running uh, clinical trials uh, with COVID um, where we want people to stay in their home, right? So that's been um, definitely part of the model with even just our COVID-19 um, studies. Uh, now more and more companies, though, are wanting to be more patient centric and starting to build this offering in, in their new clinical trials. So what used to be part of very kind of a very specific niche is what John was stating earlier, really wanting to have more and more of their studies uh, be, be done in this model um, and be more patient centric. It's, it's not appropriate for every study. If you have an MRI, you still have to, to go in, you know, for certain imaging, things like that. 
Um, but there are a number of things that you can do. Um, there's not really one good best therapeutic area for this. Um, I think a good example is you can have an oncology study, um, you know, so a cancer study and a dermatology study. Um, and you can, for example, just taking on a, a firma example, you can be doing the same exact things in the home. So you could be doing um, a blood draw and vital signs and a sample collection. And those are two very different, um, you know, cancer study and a, and a dermatology study, but um, similar things. So it really is looking at each protocol and designing um, around that. But it has been very relevant for some disease populations, perhaps some rare disease populations, um, folks with motility issues. When you think about people coming to a site and they have, um, let's just say Parkinson's disease, you know, the thought of going to a big university hospital and um, parking in the big garage and then, you know, walking four buildings over and then finding the clinic in, in building 5A, uh, you know, that, that's a big deal. And that could be um, something that is prohibitive. So um, folks that are maybe immunocompromised, uh, those are the areas where we're gonna see the biggest benefit. Um, and, and kind of what was touched on a little earlier by Jennifer, the ability to bring clinical trials to underrepresented populations. Maybe they don't have transportation, maybe they don't have childcare. Um, increasing that diversity in, in decentralized trials, um, in clinical trials in general, is really an important outcome of decentralized trials. So hopefully that gave you a little bit of a flavor for kind of what you can and can't do. We're seeing less of this, you'll see less of this in the phase, the phase one, the very beginning stages of studies. And as you move on throughout the life cycle of the clinical trial, it gets a little easier to, to bring this um, to the home. But um, yeah, I think uh, really, um, the, the setting up of the protocol at the beginning um, and not being so concerned maybe with the disease and the disease population, um, getting that innovation is really what's most important. That, that makes perfect sense. I, I'd also add just, a, you know, as, as an aside, you know, I think I've seen discussion of the convenience factor and the, the, the patient, centric, patient centricity, easy for me to say, uh, that factor uh, playing into it as well, where if you're uh, you know, someone who spends three or four months of the year in, in Florida, uh, you know, maybe you've now gotten back to Chicago. I, I hear, uh, you know, today's the, the first 60 degree day. So uh, maybe the, the, the snowbirds aren't as concerned about it, but for them to be able to, to stay in the trial and stay active on their, their visits uh, while they are, you know, at their, their winter home is something that, that may appeal to them and, and bring them into the, the trial where they otherwise may not have uh, enrolled. So um, you know, a, kind of the opposite end of the spectrum, but, but another interesting use case. Um, John, I'll, I'll turn to you. Uh, I'd like to talk about uh, the, the technology standpoint. What are some of the key changes that have taken place in the last few years? You know, I think you made reference to the phone in your, in your opening comments, uh, but, you know, maybe some of the other, uh, you know, real infrastructure changes that have made it possible to use decentralized clinical trials effectively. Um, and, you know, this could even be in terms of increased relative comfort with the, you know, people's use of technology, the use of technology in healthcare, uh, or, or the changes to the, te to the technology itself. Sure. The, the, it strikes me because when Jennifer made the comment, it just really resonated, uh, this piece. I remember we did the simulation. The simulation is we, we build a study. It's a pilot study. We bring in real participants, real sites, and they go through essentially a mock study. And that's how we built our technology. That's also how we you know continue to get patient insights. So we're making sure we're thinking about and being the participant when we design studies. And in one of those, I remember we're behind a glass wall. It's very much like a you know TV market research looking thing. And you're behind this wall. And one of the people running it said, and this is what you're going to do. And the gentleman that was an elderly patient said, isn't this how they all work? And, and it struck me to think he's right. Like it's intuitive. So I, when Jennifer was saying, making the comment, I, we find it really, um, really humbling that we have to step back and actually tell participants in our training and brochures, this is what a clinical trial really looks like. This model we're giving you looks like this. Here's the advantages. Because when you just show them a DCT, they go, oh, well, that makes total sense. Like, and that that's how all trials are run, right? And we have to go, well, no. And so I think I want to start there that 
well, there's this perceptional barrier that people think in the world that because technology is in a place, right, where we're doing everything on this. And that's not a not a U.S. discussion. It's a global discussion. Remember, we're 18th in the world in digital enablement. So we are not even in the U.S., not even close to being the coolest in school to use mobile technology. But when you think about this component, I think what's really striking is, is that there's um, technology is at a place in our society right now where it's an expectation. It's, it's not a, oh, that would be nice. It's a, why don't you have? And so when you kind of stem off of that, um, you know, even though we've been doing this, we were doing this for years before the pandemic, the pandemic accelerated a few things. And the acceleration is maybe what I'll, I'll uh, spend time on is um, if you tried to buy a webcam last year, you would have been on a six month back order list because Jennifer's institution and other key leading institutions actually had to get them first, right? Why? Because everybody upgraded their equipment. Why are iPhone sales, Android sales at the highest levels they've ever been when there's a financial crisis in our country? Why? Because everybody bought new equipment to live their lives. And so what I would say is we had a seismic shift, not just in the US, but globally, and that everybody just upgraded their baseline BYOD, bring your own device equipment across the board. And we, who used to provision lots of things like iPads to, clinic, to clinics and said, I don't even know if I have Wi-Fi in the back room, right? We were provisioning that stuff. That has really changed. Know that the infrastructure of an economy really moves the needle on these types of things. And I would say the other thing from a tech perspective um, that, that's really kind of striking to us is early on, we would, we would teach people how to do their first telehealth virtual visit. So I would get on with the site or we do a training and we'd say, have, have any of you ever done it? And you'd have like one half hand raised and that was it. And we go, okay, let me show you what it looks like to demystify sort of what this is. Fast forward to today, a number of people are like, oh, I just did, I did telehealth the last couple of months. So for them to come in and look at and use these solutions and, and get, they, it just kind of comes a little, not fully naturally, but a lot more naturally than it used to. And so what I would say is when we look at kind of where, uh, you know, technology has really moved um, those, the level of comfort, the level of it just being a, an ex, a expected standard has really made a shift in our industry. And frankly, it's on us. Like we have to take advantage of and lean into the situation because if we don't, we will regress, right? And so I think um, that's really the key here. When we look at tech, tech is already there. Um, the challenge in our industry, last point, is that it's a lot of individuals think it's really easy to make tech. And, it, and it's actually not. Technology is really hard to do. Um, my 13-year-old can code. That doesn't mean he can build a platform to help you decentralize your study. Okay, those are two very different things. But when you think about clinical trials, we all have to remember we're in a completely different regulatory environment. It takes lots of money, lots of know-how, and lots of experience to get these things where they need to go. And so these changes from a tech perspective do not happen overnight. They happen over time. Perfect. Now that, that, that's, that's interesting. Uh, you can't just bring all the technology you expect to use. You've you got to be prepared to, to roll with the punches on, on what other folks are showing up with. Um, Melissa, I'd, I'd like to turn it back to you. Uh, tell us about some of the operational changes that exist in the deployment of these DCTs uh, and maybe even where the solution might not rely on technology. And, and lastly, are these areas where, you know, from what you're seeing now, you ultimately expect technology to fill the gap or, uh, you know, what, what is the current expectation on what that last mile uh, might always be? Yeah, and I think John teed up really nicely when he talked about the regulatory um, differences and challenges, because I think that's the first thing that comes to mind when I think about operationally um, doing this, what we face day to day um, is the varying regulations in different countries across the world. Um, and maybe um, not super clear direction, or they're just starting to dip their toes, or they've had something out for a while, but um, it's not really holistically keeping up with the tech. Um, so that's something that um, every day that we kind of face that you can run the same clinical trial globally, as clinical trials typically are global, but maybe have a little bit of different rules in the United States versus France, you know, versus South Africa. So um, that's number one, kind of one of the operational challenges is, you know, that's not all necessarily harmonized. Um, you know, we, we can't maybe necessarily decentralize every protocol. We can have a hybrid approach, 
but perhaps we can do more if we plan for this at the beginning. Um, you know, right now, probably what John's seen and what, what I've seen and what Jennifer's gone through is during the pandemic, it was rush, rush, rush to figure out how, almost how we can decentralize it as the study was going. It was a snowball, something that was already going and er, we had to stop it and say, wait, what can we do? People don't wanna come in. Well, now we have to switch our way of thinking and develop the protocol from the beginning. And really you need lots of lead time to plan this out with the technology, with the regulations, with what can we do in the home, with what can we not do in the home. Um, and really no tech is required for that. That's just planning. Um, like John said, the tech is, is really already there. Um, we have plenty of tech that can enable us. Um, you know, my eight-year-old parents are, uh, wow, lots of telehealth visits. Um, they're, they're getting used to it. When we're talking with sites and we're incorporating telehealth in our in-home visits, more and more people, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, got that, got that. The tech's there. Um, you know, people actually learn, you know, pretty quickly. The challenge is for our industry um, that we unlearn some of our behaviors, um, you know, going forward. So I think the tech will enhance, you know, with wearables and real-time responses to questionnaires and the transmission of with that data. Um, but there's no tech required to put the best plan, plan in place regarding a clinical trial and, um, you know, decentralizing as much as you can and maybe go to the site at pointed times. So um, yeah, I, it sounds simple. Um, but that planning is really key and really the technology isn't really required for that. It makes total sense, makes total sense. Well, you know, I think we've talked a little bit about what DCTs are and, uh, you know, kind of what, you know, what has gotten us to, to this point. Uh, I would like to now turn and, and uh, you know, on, on kind of a, a you know, no, no, no one will be held to this. I'll, I'll, I'll disclaim it up front, but I'd like to do a little bit of vision casting to see where DCTs are going. I would like uh, first to uh, to reiterate our, our team's uh, uh, solicitation for questions. If folks have questions for the panel today, please feel free to drop them into the the, the chat function uh, here on Zoom, and we'll have we should have some time to to turn to those. But uh, in advance of that, let, let's talk about where DCTs are going. Um, you know, I think that we see a, a, lot, of, uh, a lot of intersections uh, between life sciences and the technology. Um, and, you know, I think the, the three of you have seen uh, the, the evolution of, of decentralized clinical trials up to now. So, um, you know, we might spend a few minutes talking about where they're going. Um, so my, my first question is to Jennifer. Uh, will your organization be making permanent investments in participating in decentralized clinical trials? Uh, or do you expect to continue to partner with organizations that provide those DCT solutions? Do you foresee a future where DCT is the point of differentiation and one that you'll push uh, as you try to engage with your patient population? Or, uh, you know, tell us a little bit more about how you uh, and OSF think about the, uh, you know, the embrace of DCTs going forward. Yeah, thanks. I think for us, it's a little too soon to tell from the standpoint that uh, we have been reactionary uh, to the pandemic. And now we're taking a, a step back and really looking forward around strategy. And, and where are we going? With anything that we do, uh, we really look at uh, a deep discernment around, do we, do we buy it? Do we build it? Do we partner uh, with someone? Uh, do we, uh, how do we uh, get the most value and uh, speed to our patients? And so I do think that, you know, there's a lot of analysis that's still continuing to be done around this as we look at what our partnerships will look like in the future going forward. Do I think it's a differentiator? Absolutely. Uh, so in my mind, it's certainly a, a piece of our future. I think it is a differentiator from an access standpoint. I think it's a differentiator from an experience standpoint. And it's certainly a, a differentiator um, for scale and, and, and how many, um, you know, how to, to John's point earlier, how you bring the cost down uh, so that you can continue to, to reinvest. Fantastic. Thank you. It's very interesting. 
um, yeah, may, maybe from the kind of the the the, the provider side, or I, you know, I, I hesitate to use the word vendor because I, I realize that it's such a complicated position. But but John, you know, uh, help us think through the way you guys see down the road. Uh, you know, whether that's five years, ten years, uh, further into the future, wh what what breakthroughs or even new technologies or old you know uh, old skill sets, you know, planning and, and those types of core competencies, you know. Where, where do you see the road going and what's it going to take to get there? Um, I think I describe DCT as like the band that just got signed. Uh, we've been touring for 10 years. You're just now hearing the record. Like it's actually been here. It's, it's just getting more traction because, you know, necessity forces education in a lot of ways, right? It, it means that we have to, to jump on board. And so, yeah, Jennifer's absolutely right. I think when we look at this from our perspective, right, vendor, supplier, whoever, the, doing this in clinical trials, there are features, things like telehealth that are, will be and, and could argue are commodities, right? So these are not about the platform. These are about the best platforms for fit for purpose uses, right, in different situations. And that's how the market will shape. And I think when you, when you look at uh, what matters going forward, there's two statements I'd make. One is, you know, the, um, we're moving forward past the pandemic, right? And, and as we do that, most of our large pharma, large biotech customers ask two questions. One is, is they have corporate initiatives to take cost out of the system by decentralizing. Um, and so we spend a lot of time helping design clinical trials and protocols and things that meet that. Second thing is, is I had three conversations this morning where I'll get asked, who are the sites that are industry leading in DCT, right? Because they're looking for people to match up right? Where a lot of uh, different individuals in the market talk about sightless models and all that. That's, we, we don't, the, we are all about enabling and being an augment tool for sites because the site of the, uh, the site of the future is they all, is sites getting on board with this and wanting to do it. And I think we have to help them do a good job of that and make sure the tech is really standard. So it falls in the background. Now, what I would tell you is, um, is that, you know, when I look at the future, I, I think this world decentralized studies, if you kind of mark it up here, I think we're going to strike through the word decentralized soon. Just like, like mm -hmm. I've been saying, you know, I started my career in digital health and, and I heard for the first time a, a, a head of an RA say, oh, it's health. And I went, thank you. I think we're going to see that where this word decentralized is strike through. And this is just how trials run. That's the mission we're on. That's what we're doing at Thread. But I would tell you that it, um, if you're going to quote me on something and, and come back and, and bite me in five years, I would say it's that this stuff is the adopted study model. It just is what it is. And it, Melissa noted it really well. This does, it's, it's not a study design. It's an approach methodology that you apply. And so we've got oncology studies that people would say, you can't do that in oncology. I'd say, who told you that? Right, we got one B oncology studies doing doing you know coached coached um, uh, uh, ECOAs and you know actigraphy devices to check overall movement that's never been checked before for new endpoints. Right, we've got you know, and then you look at the other spheres. So there are a ton of examples of where this really moves the needle for research, and I think that's really what we're going to see is this decentralized studies just become studies. And it's frankly, it's how much effort we put into it to make it the standard and kind of demystify the process to really apply it to the trials we're hoping today. So that's that's my two cents on it. Um, and that's really where Thread's mission and vision align to what we're trying to accomplish. That's great, that's great. Uh, Melissa, your turn. What, wh how, how, do, how, does, how do you and how does Firma think about the, the future and uh, you know, what's it gonna take to get there? Yeah, and well, it's funny because John talks about a band that has just been signed and I've used the analogy of this was a book that was written years ago, but, um, you know, it just got signed to a to a Hollywood movie deal. Um, so similar, but a little different. <laughs> um, I think in the future, you know, my hope is our regulatory guidance increases um, to help guide this a little more, make things maybe a little easier, less red tape. And um, the hope is that the technology increases as well. Um, but like, like we've said, we think the technology is there. Of course, it will, will increase. And that my hope is that it is planned for and it is part of our methodology, not a reaction to. And all that becomes the norm. Uh, because I think the COVID-19 pandemic has made, quote, clinical trials part of our mainstream vocabulary and vernacular with with the media's attention on vaccine trials, for example. 
So, you know, I think that it's demystified, like John said, and, and clinical trials are less mysterious. And so we can become more patient centric. And so we can have more inclusivity and more participants um, into this model, um, because I think that that's actually really helped us with um, the vernacular of uh, clinical trials being more in the mainstream uh, media. I think it's going to take commitment from our industry not to fall back into our old working ways and to be brave enough um, to keep on this better path for our patients. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I've seen a lot more uh, you know, comfort in regular conversation around discussing clinical trials and also PCR testing. I think that's the other, uh, the, the other square on the, the COVID uh, bingo board that, that people are marking more often. Um, yeah, I, th I think we're starting to see some, some great questions scroll through the chat. So we'll, we'll give another minute uh, for, for those to come through, but uh, we, we did want to take the opportunity uh, for, for Grant and I to, to uh, sling some questions at each other. Uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll do, do that for one minute and then, uh, and then pivot over to some audience Q and A. Uh, so uh, for, first question from me to Grant. Uh, Grant, you have spent a lot of time in the virtual care sector throughout your career. Uh, how are some of the broader trends in telehealth that you've outlined in your white papers, for instance, coming to reality through decentralized clinical trials? Yeah. Well, this is a consistent theme. We, we've made more progress in the last 12 months than we probably have in the last 12 years in telehealth broadly. And it really is just about brute force engagement, awareness of the solutions and trust. But at the, at the core, telehealth is really about expanding access. How do you create a trusted vehicle for expanding access and creating tools, technology to ensure adherence and compliance to what it is the guided protocols are? So you know, those are the basic tenets and themes across the wide variety of what's taking place in the telehealth space. But to me, why this is such an important topic, it, this is really more about compassion. This is a more compassionate way to deliver the care. Why make somebody get into their car and drive 75 miles in a rural setting for a test that 75% of it or whatever can be done at home? This is just a better medium and that drives a level of compliance and adherence because of that. But at the end of this, Patrick, this is about, there's a good segue to your question I'm gonna to hand to you is, this is really about finding a tool and technology that has a level of trust and a level of safety embedded in it that people are comfortable using it. And you know, so Patrick, you know, you've been involved now in creating a special interest group at the American Telemedicine Association. And this is an unabashed plug. I'm the board member of the ATA, so I want everybody on this call to be joining. Um, but what do you think are some of the near-term priorities that a thoughtful group like that uh, should be focused on in order to make the DCT and the decentralized clinical trials a robust sector? Yeah, uh, thanks, Grant. And, you know, it, it gets tactical pretty quickly. You know, I, I, I won't go into the weeds on the, the various special interest groups that have formed around this effort. What I can tell you is that at the, 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 the organizational level, there was a recognition immediately that there needs to be input taken from the entire spectrum of stakeholders that are involved, uh, not only with decentralized clinical trials, but the legacy, you know, kind of bricks and mortar model that, you know, necessarily needs to be uh, a partner to decentralized clinical trials. So it's all about taking input from uh, the various regulatory bodies that, that need to make sure that these clinical trials are indistinguishable no matter where they've been delivered. Uh, and that is, you know, even, uh, you know, kind of, you know, kind of double clicking on that, you're talking about the FDA, but then you're also talking about all these state level, uh, you know, kind of medical regulatory boards and, and the, 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 the consequences of investigational product crossing state lines, things of that nature. So there's just a lot of complexity and a lot of input that needs to be taken. It extends further to the pharma and, and various sponsors themselves, the, the sites, uh, even the patients. So it's just necessary to take a lot of input from a lot of people to make sure that the, the solution that's being developed, the, 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 the trial design that's being developed it is you know taking the best of the best of all worlds. Uh, the other thing that I think that the the ATA has had a lot of focus on is making sure that it is uh, you know advocating for decentralized clinical trials in a collaborative way. There are a number of other organizations that are also 
you know, trying to advance awareness and the cause for decentralized clinical trials. And it's imperative that there's a consistent message across all of those bodies and that each of those bodies is, you know, working on something in parallel with everybody else and, and that there's not a lot of redundant effort uh, or the risk of, of contradictory messaging. So uh, those are two things where at the strategic level, the ATA has been uh, very diligent. Um, but uh, thank you for the for the question, Grant. And uh, you know, I, I'd like to to thank the panelists, uh, my you know, personally uh, in advance. Uh, you know, I think we'll dive into some uh, some questions. I think I see some some great questions scrolling down the column here, and we can start to to feed those out to the, to the panel. Um, and then uh, looks like we're also on track for uh, a punctual wrap up. So uh, the, the other uh, the other important goal here. Uh, I'm going to start with the, the first question that I did see uh, come across that was offered to all the panelists. So uh, you, you guys, you know, you take turns or, or, or one person could jump on it. But the question is this, with DCTs getting access to patients in more rural areas and outside of the city centers, uh, like you've mentioned, how are the sites or supporting organizations getting to those patients and who is doing the patient visit? So talk a little bit about the, the actual operational rollout, um, you know, give us some perspectives on this, this uh, interaction between the site and the, the DCT solution. Yeah, this is Melissa. I can talk a, a little bit about that, kind of how we're operationalizing that. Um, so we uh, will, you know, when a trial is implemented, work with our, our um, our, our sponsors are CROs. I saw that as another question, so I can answer that since, <laughs> since I'm there. Uh, we, we, with Firma, where we're providing those in-home services, we work with CROs, uh, you know, or sponsors directly. Someone asked that. Um, but, you know, what we're going to do is we're going to find um, someone that lives typically within an hour driving distance of the home. Um, what that means is we will source a nurse. Um, that can provide whatever services are in the in the home. Uh, it, it typically is a nurse. It could be someone like a phlebotomist. If it's purely a simple blood draw, sometimes you want a phlebotomist over a nurse doing that blood draw because that's what they do all day every day. Um, but you know that's how we're supporting um, the patients, and we are you know training them on what needs to be done and um, making sure that that connection happens with the site. Um, you know, there's, there's all sorts of regulatory things that we need to do to ensure that the site is okay with delegating that particular responsibility uh, to be done in the home. So from a home, in-home perspective, um, we work with the site, we work with the sponsor and we train and we find a provider close to the patient so that, you know, that same nurse can keep going back um, to the home um, throughout the trial. Um, you know, maybe there's 10 visits that can be done at home and they only have to go um, into the clinic for, for two times. So that's great, it, you know, even better. Um, so we work with the sponsor um, to do that, to bring that to the patient, um, also the site as well, because that's an important piece of it. Hopefully that answered the question from my perspective. I, I think it did. Uh, that's, that, that, that's, that's one vote in your favor. Um, so I, just to kind of manage time and tee up the, the next couple of questions, I think I see a couple of great questions that allow us to take some, some great perspectives here. Uh, the first will go to John, and it's kind of a, a macro level question uh, and, and, and uh, the ability to, to talk a little bit more about the international aspects of decentralized clinical trials and, and some of your perspectives there. And then when you've made uh, your comments there, Jennifer, we'd love to get, you know, kind of your perspectives on uh, the, the implementation at the site level and, you know, your understanding of any upfront costs and, and, and costs that the, the site might bear in uh, adding that decentralized clinical trial element to the, to the trials that you're conducting. So kind of a, a, a micro perspective after John's macro perspective. Uh, John, it, talk to us about the international aspects. So what we know is, is what we've experienced doing. So we're doing, uh, running decentralized trials in almost 50 countries. Um, and that's, that's Europe, it's Asia PAC, it's Latin America, and it's Asia Pacific. Um, and what you'll find as we uh, think about international forays, one is that, uh, I guess to a couple of key points, one is that the context of use of DCT is really important. So whereas in the US, right, uh, uh, 
you know, where there are hospital systems that have, you know, say eight, an average of seven to eight telehealth providers in one clinic, right? Because they use different models. Uh, when you go out sort of ex US, that's not as, as norm. And so, so really what regulators and others are looking for is when you do a telehealth virtual visit, right? When I, when I give the provider access, what are they going to do and not do during that visit? And so what you'll find is that when you go international, the actually the international regulations are very favorable to things like telehealth and ECOA and apps and messaging. Uh, really the two biggest challenges that uh, customers run into at scale, and I hate to say this, but it's, it is what happens, electronic consenting, because that's still the world that's changing. And we have some countries that from a reg standpoint say they don't approve it and they've approved it on some of this study and not approved it on another. And so even though regulations are relaxing and changing, Remember that there's no such thing as a signature in most Asia PAC countries. It's a stamp or a, a you know an, an opt-in message, and so so there are international, there are global differences. Um, but when you think about sort of case studies, what I'd tell you is when you look at these, uh, the other thing that changes is even though in some locations, say in China and Japan, where you have great access to mobile devices, it's actually not uh, as much of a norm to do BYOD. There's actually still device provisioning that's done at a higher clip. So a lot of differences as you sort of move around the world in doing this, but I would tell you at the heart of it, you know, the technology services how you conduct things and gives flexibility and options. And then when you give and empower sites in different geographies, the ability to have flexible options so they can choose that I want them to come into clinic or I want to do this via telehealth. Um, we're taking sort of this what people perceive as a regimented approach to we're going to do telehealth on visit to and every country the end and when you get flexibility and option which i'll tell you is still innovative in our space still growing when you give that option the the amount of usage for digital technology drastically goes up because what you'll find is just like you and me like i i'm a digital guy i'm a nerd all i've done my whole life is build tech and sell stuff right that's what i do in tech and uh, I'm going to see my doctor, Chris, in two weeks because I just want to go to my clinic at Duke and see Chris. I haven't, I've done all telehealth. And so I'm going to go do that. And, and, and I love that I had the choice to do it, but others are going to say, I just give me the app and move on. And so I think what I'm trying to tell you is internationally, there are cultural nuances and differences of that, but the flexibility still supports and enables those cultural nuances to make sure that everybody gets to use it as much as they see fit. Perfect. Got it. Uh, Jennifer, you know, to the extent that you've kind of been involved in these types of conversations, talk to us about, uh, you know, the, the costs that you've incurred setting up in, any of these types of, of capabilities or maybe just where there were, uh, you know, differences versus the expectation. Yeah, and I, I can't really talk about specific costs just from the standpoint that we're really, really relatively new on this journey. But what I can just say is that there is a lot of factors that go into that, right? There's um, what kind of trials you're going to do, uh, what kind of tech you're going to use. The data becomes really important, you know, how you're going to use data, how data is going to flow. So I do think that there's just so many factors that come into that, what kind of scale you're trying to get. It's really hard to uh, put a, a number on that, but certainly uh, a deep analysis needs to occur. Fair enough. Fair enough. Well, listen, I, I think we see some additional great questions flowing through. I'm, I'm worried that, uh, that they're starting to get meaty enough that, that we'll, we'll run out of time. So we may uh, you know, cut it short here today, but uh, on our you know, next masterclass session, we'll, we'll get into some of the, the, the real you know, strategic, uh, you know, strategic you know, spider webs that exist in decentralized clinical trials. Um, so uh, you know, I'll, I'll just make a few parting comments here. I want to thank everybody for joining today, uh, especially our panelists, John Wright, Melissa Nezos, and Jennifer Junis. Appreciate you guys respecting your, uh, or representing your respective organizations and giving us a little bit different vantage point. Uh, and thanks also to HC3 and grants my colleague, Jenny Poth, for helping get this pulled together. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I feel like it's been a great success, but I'm, but I'm biased. Grant, any any parting comments? Oh, this, this this was absolutely wonderful, and and I you know interesting thing is I think these panels and doing it in this forum and this type is, is honestly turned out to be, you know, a, a potentially a better medium than actually trying to force ourselves uh, at a table, and and looking at each other in that manner. Um, it, and it's it's thematic to sort of what we're describing here. These these things do work really wonderfully. And thank you so much for participating here. 
Well, I'm just going to hop in and say thank you to both our moderators, Grant and Patrick, and the team at Ziegler for their support in producing today's program. Many thanks to each of you, our panelists, Jennifer, Melissa, and John, for your time and thoughtful insights. I find that a lot of our discussions can go on to part two and part three, but and maybe we will have to do that and get into some of these other questions. Um, the recording and recap for this event will be available on our website if you're a little late or want to share this with someone later. Um, it should be available within the next few days. Additionally, I encourage you to check out more information about our upcoming events, including our next one, which is Thursday, March 18th at 12 noon, which we will be presented in partnership with HC3 members, Sinai Chicago and Medical Home Network to discuss our recent publication, The Challenging Future of the Chicago Safety Net. You can learn more about our events and then what we're doing at www.hc3.health. Thank you all so much for your time. Enjoy the rest of your day and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you.